So, all right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us um, for today's talk from fellowship to employment uh, with Dr. Josh Goldman. I had a privilege of hearing him give this talk. He's given it at UCLA a number of times. It's a great talk. So thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Shane Hudnall. I'll be moderating. Um, I'm the assistant to the fellowship director here at on the East Coast, well, he's on the West Coast at the Cone Health Sports Medicine Fellowship. Um, and then during today's talk, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Goldman, uh, if you could just put them in the chat box, if you're feeling shy, go ahead and you can send them to me directly, that'd be fine. I'll collate them and, and we'll chat at the end, uh, kind of go back and forth with, with some answers. Just to give you a heads up, you know, this is the first in what will be hopefully a long series of economics-based lectures um, we've got next month, um, so December, look for those emails, uh, a talk on contract negotiations by attorney Long Doe that will be moderated by uh, Dr. Sal Portugal. Then in January, we've got Dr. Matt Leisler that's going to uh, present on the AMSSM annual salary and practice survey. That'll be moderated by Dr. Michelle Henney. And then in the future, we've got a couple more in the works and then a lot more beyond that. But Billing and coding and how to establish yourself in a practice uh, are coming up. Just a few other notes. I'd like to just acknowledge a few people um, other than Dr. Goldman for being here today. Uh, thanks to Andy Meyer for advertising and arranging this talk, getting us all set up with Zoom. Um, and obviously, you know, the Dr. Cynthia Labella, Dr. Michael Schwartzson, and Brian Williams for their support and guidance on this and uh, many other topics to come. Um, and then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Elliot Hu, uh, our fearless leader. He's been the head of our economics working group, and we can thank him for, for being here. It's now a uh, subcommittee of the Practice and Policy Committee, uh, but big thanks to him for spearheading all of this, uh, just keeping us going, providing uh, some great feedback uh, on this talk and future talks. So, so thanks, Elliot. Now let's talk about the man of the hour, uh, Dr. Josh Goldman. Um, so he's a health science assistant clinical professor within the departments of family medicine and orthopedic surgery at UCLA. In addition to his UCLA health clinical practice, he's the team physician for UCLA football, men's soccer, and women's water polo teams. He's previously served as team physician for UCLA baseball, softball, and men's volleyball, as well as a volunteer team physician with the US Olympic Training Center, USA Hockey, and the Association of Volleyball Professionals. He also serves in many administrative roles within UCLA, uh, including being the Associate Director for the Orthopedic Institute for Children's Center uh, for Sports Medicine, the Associate Director of the UCLA Steve Tisch Brain Sport Program, and the Program Director for the UCLA Sports Medicine Fellowship, uh, which we just talked about, they've been busy. So he received both his medical degree and Master in Business Administration from the University of Southern California. He completed residency training in family medicine at UCLA, and his sports medicine fellowship training also at UCLA. Uh, he's a member of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, where he serves on the education and fellowship committees, the PAC-12 Student Athlete Health uh, Conference Committee, and the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, so take it away, Dr. Josh Goldman. <clears throat> Thanks, Shane. Appreciate you, uh, you guys having me here today. And again, thank you to Elliot and the uh, Sports Economics uh, Working Group. We're Really excited about uh, some of the talks we have in the pipeline. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk about that process of going from fellowship to employment. And when my fellows arrive on campus in July every year, I tell them their most important job is to learn how to be a great sports medicine physician. And their second most important job is to find a job. Because uh, at the end of the day, our goal is to get you those dream jobs when you're, you're finishing your fellowship. And so today we're gonna to talk about what that process looks like. You know, we, we learn a lot about the practice of sports medicine in our fellowship training, but we learn very little about how to interview and, and acquire that dream job that we're training so hard to get. So today we're going to walk you through that process and hopefully help you uh, prepare for the interviews that you have in the pipeline. Uh, our roadmap for today, we're going to start with talking about the preparation and the search. Next, we'll talk about what that interview process looks like. And lastly, I'll make sure we save plenty of time for Q&A because I think that's where we can have some really fun conversation. So the five commandments of the search, really this is where I want you to think from the beginning of your search. And these are tips I have looking back on my search and the blunders I made along the way. First and foremost, you need to know what you're looking for. Before you go find your dream job, you need to know what your dream job is. 
Second, your dream job is never going to be posted online. And if it is, to be honest, they probably already filled it behind the scenes. Number three, you need to let that network work for you. So you've met a lot of great people along your path to sports medicine and through your sports medicine training. And so you wanna put those people to work helping you find that ideal job. Fourth, you wanna stay formal in that process. One of the things I love about sports medicine is that it's a more casual field. People are very collegial. Uh, we wear polo shirts to work a lot of the times, but when it comes to the job search process, I really wanna encourage you to stay formal. Number five, and this is something we've never had to think about in your path to fellowship, which is slow playing the process. What that means is, you're going to be offered jobs in a staggered way. It's not like a fellowship match where you open an email on match day and you find out where you're going. You're gonna be offered jobs in this rolling fashion. And so it's really important for you to allow the process to try and line up as much as possible as you're looking at many different positions. So in this case, you don't wanna to commit to a job until you're absolutely required to do so, or you know that it's that dream job, at which point, please absolutely take that job. So let's talk about the preparation of the search. Um, and I love this long time Confucius quote, choose a job you love and you will never work another day in your life. So the first part of this process is knowing yourself, okay? Again, going back to that dream job, we really need to flesh out what that dream job looks like and means for you. So this includes things like location, practice setting. Is this a multi-specialty group? Is this an orthopedic surgery practice? Is this a family medicine practice? Uh, what does that group size look like? Do you like being an independent practitioner? Would you prefer a larger group with lots of partners? Uh, what does the call schedule look like? If you, uh, like my wife, just can't imagine waking up in the middle of the night to answer a phone call, then having a lot of calls is probably a bad idea for you. Um, you know, we all have our different interests in terms of our, our primary specialty. Do you enjoy inpatient medicine? Do you enjoy obstetrics? And then there's things like compensation, uh, certainly a significant part of the job. We all want to make sure that we're being appropriately compensated for the work that we're doing. Uh, work hours for some of us are really important. Maintaining that work-life balance is going to be key for you. Partners is key, and, and this is something I really counsel residents looking at fellowship, but it's even more important for fellows looking at jobs, which is your partners will make or break your life. If you have a great group of partners that you can rely on when you're out of town that do a great job of cross covering for you, whose work you trust and can help with patient follow-up if for some reason you're pulled away from clinic, that's gonna make your life so much better. So really the quality of those partners, the ability for you to see yourself working with them collegially is gonna be huge. Risk tolerance is something you need to think about, which we really haven't had to consider at any point in our training. And this is really relative to compensation. So there are lots of ways to structure your salary. And what you need to think about is, how much risk are you willing to take? Do you want to go in a productivity model where it's high risk, high reward? If you're really busy, you're making a lot of money. But if you're not, you're not making much money versus you know, a flat salary where you get paid to show up to work every day. And if you're busy, great. And if you're not busy, great. But the institution is going to pay you regardless. Uh, the next piece to think about is teaching. Uh, many of us, most of us in academic medicine really love teaching. It's what gets us excited about going to work every day. Um, but not everybody does. And so, you know, if you're the one of those people who does not like teaching residents and fellows and medical students, then an institution with a teaching mission is not going to be great for you. And then lastly, you really should start to think about that patient population. Um, you know, in an academic center like UCLA, I have a really diverse patient population that I get to take care of, and that's a huge bonus for me. But if you have really specific subpopulations in sports medicine that you're excited about taking care of, you want to make sure you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, so step two is really starting to think about that timeline. So for those of you who are currently fellows, you are almost halfway through your fellowship year, which is crazy to think about. And so there are three types of jobs that you want, you want to be considering. And the timeline for searching for those jobs really needs to line up with the timeline in which those jobs become available. So the first type of position is an existing position that is becoming newly available again. So these are often, but not always, become available with a predictable timeline. An example is a partner in a group who's planning to retire or leave the group to move to another academic center, for example. And so 
In these positions, we will typically have a lead up. The partner says they're going to retire at the end of this year, and so the group will have a year to backfill that spot. But occasionally, people get hired away to other medical groups, and so that timeline is really whatever the obligation of their contract is, two weeks, six weeks, three months, whatever is built into their contract. And so uh, it can be narrower depending on the reason people are leaving. Position number two is a planned expansion position. So these are positions within existing medical groups that are planning to grow. So these are often growing into new satellites. For example, UCLA is always pushing the boundaries of the, the clinical space that we cover. And so if we're expanding into the Valley or expanding into the South Bay, they'll often wanna hire a sports medicine physician to assist with that systematic expansion. This is most commonly seen in larger health systems, but can also happen in smaller private practices. Uh, you know, a three physician group gets really, really busy and they, they do the math and they realize they want to expand, bring more people on because they think they have the volume to support it. The third position is what I call the growth position. And there are a couple different sub scenarios where you can see growth in a health system. So scenario number one is an existing health system that wants to add a sports medicine service line. So maybe they have a robust orthopedic surgery department that includes sports surgery, but they never had primary care at sports medicine or non-operative orthopedics as part of their service line. And so they wanna add this whole new service line. The scenario number two is creating a position specifically for you with an existing system. This will often happen within systems that you know, so say a place that you trained with, uh, or you have a mentor who's working in another health system, and they just feel like you would be a great asset to that health system, and so they want to go out and create a position specifically for you. So this is what those timelines will look like. So for existing positions where somebody's leaving a group and they need to backfill, if they can plan long-term, this is usually gonna be a six month process. Somebody tells you I'm retiring at the end of the year, we wanna hire somebody January one and they let the group know in June so they have six months to really start to do that due diligence. However, if somebody's leaving more expeditiously, they give you six weeks notice, then typically we'll wanna hire much faster. So as short as a three month window. The expansion positions where we're a health system, we've done our due diligence, we decide we wanna expand, typically they'll start looking with a, a six month lead up time. That gives them lots of time to really interview lots of folks and make sure they're finding the right person for the right position, onboard them and let them hit the ground running. Those growth positions are the ones that take the longest amount of time to create. So especially if you're in a larger health system or a, a bureaucratic academic system, it takes a lot of time to go from position idea to departmental and university approval to hire people or institutional approval for a, a more private group to bring on somebody in a whole new capacity. And so these growth positions are going to be a much longer lead up, probably 12 to 18 months. So my, my tip for you as you're starting to think about your job search process is you want to align your search timeline with the types of positions that you're pursuing. If you want to go into this growth type position, have a position built specifically for you from the ground up, starting right now in November to start a job in June is not realistic. So you have to be willing to wait a little bit if that's what you're looking for. But if it's an expansion position and you've already heard some rumblings about a, a health system growing, you're in a perfect timeline to start in this June, July, August uh, time window, given that right now we're in November. So step three, once you understand that type of job you're looking for is to start to shake the trees is what I call it. Um, and this is really that hustling process of putting your network to use, really starting to have meaningful conversations with people in health systems or regions of the country that you're interested in practicing in. The three best places for you to start are number one, your sports medicine faculty. So uh, you are in a fellowship program your sports medicine faculty know people all over the country. We take care of athletes that move around the world together. We collaborate on research. And so we really can be a huge asset for you as you start to look for jobs. Number two are your alumni connections. So people are very proud to have chained in your fellowship program. And they are very excited to help their uh, people coming out of their program find jobs. So do not be afraid to reach out to alumni from your program that are working in health systems around the country and ask them about opportunities in their system. And number three, which I don't really think we think about is family and friends. You know, I'll give you a scenario. One of our fellows a few years ago was from the Colorado area, wanted to go back to Colorado, 
had a high school friend whose dad was an orthopedic surgeon in a really prestigious private practice and just sent his buddy a note and said, hey, you mind if I talk to your dad and just ask about positions in the area? Ended up being hired by the group and it's been a fantastic fit for him. So don't be afraid to reach out to friends and family who are working in orthopedics or sports medicine or family medicine that are inside of health systems or regions of the country that you'd be interested in practicing in. There's also lots of other opportunities. So recruiting services, you know, I, I think these are really good if you're looking for a job in a rural part of the country or an underserved part of the country. But uh, recruiting services are usually looking for people to go into jobs that are hard to fill. All right. So probably not your best bet. Uh, networking events, very similar. So it's a really great way to meet people from lots of different health systems. But again, if you're meeting a lot of recruiters, they're probably trying to fill less desirable jobs just by default. Uh, medical groups and private physicians. So if you know the region of the country you want to live in, or you know a specific medical group that you're just so passionate about and you want to be a part of, reach out to that group directly. Start to talk to the physicians in those groups and see if you can network your way in. And then lastly, you can put all of our digital platforms to work. So LinkedIn, Doximity, Facebook. Um, I really would encourage you to use these more for your due diligence as opposed to your first point of contact, but they can be really valuable resources as you just want to start to understand who's working in different systems in different parts of the world. So step number four is time to make contact, which uh, has a whole different special meaning in the time of COVID. So first you want to think about who you need to be making contact with. Um, and to, to start there, you want to know who is doing the hiring. It's great to talk to lots of different people in the health system, lots of different people in the practice to really get a good sense for the feel of the practice, the collegiality, the type of work they do there. But when it comes to talking to somebody within the system about getting that job, you need to know who is doing the hiring. Who does the buck stop with? And then you want to utilize all those introductions, if you can, to connect with that person. I'm much more interested in talking to someone when I get a warm handoff from a friend or an alumni or a colleague that says, hey, this is one of our fellows. They are absolutely spectacular and they're interested in coming to your part of the world. Would you mind chatting with them? That means a lot more than a cold email. Not to say that a cold email won't work if that's all you've got. And then number two, you want to think about how you want to reach out to those people. So you really want to identify people's preferred mode of contact. Uh, I'll make a generalized statement that we probably like email as a first first bet. A phone call off the bat from a number somebody doesn't know in today's day and age, we're going to assume you're a telemarketer and send you straight to voicemail. So uh, email tends to be the first great form of contact. But going back to my initial rules of engagement, you have to stay formal. If your Gmail address is sporty spice 99 I'm not super interested in hiring you. I'm already getting a bad flavor. So uh, you want to make sure that you're using a, a really formal, professional sounding email address and that you're staying formal in those interactions. Now, once you've been able to make that initial first contact, typically over email, you want to try and get as face to face as possible. So a phone call is great. In general, the generation that is doing the hiring, the division chiefs, the department heads are used to doing business face-to-face -face or at least over the phone. So email back and forth is probably not great for you. It might be easier for them, but if you can get somebody on the phone, that's a win. And if you can sit down and meet with them, again, it's an era of COVID, so please follow your local regulations. But if you have the opportunity to meet with them face-to-face, -face, that's gonna be much more meaningful for you in your job search. So backing back up to that initial email, right? Again, it's great if you can have a warm, introduction from somebody who knows the person doing the hiring. Um, but as you're crafting that email, remember the people in these higher ranking positions, the people that in general are doing the hiring are getting hundreds of emails a day. And so you want to make sure you are clear and concise in that email communication. Okay. So subject can be interested in sports medicine position, dear Dr. So-and-so, I'm a sports medicine fellow here. I'm interested in returning to Los Angeles and would love to talk to you about potential opportunities at UCLA. Let me know if you have any chance to speak in the coming weeks. Super simple. If you send me an email with 15 paragraphs in your life story, I eventually will read it, but I'm going to open it. I'm going to save it for later and I'm going to try and get back to it next time I have a lot of downtime. And you don't want to do that. You, want to, you don't want to turn somebody off with paragraphs of text about your life. You just want to get them on the phone and be able to spend some time talking to them. So I really encourage you to keep things clear and concise uh, if possible. 
So step number five, you want to build your sales package. Uh, and this includes three really important components. Number one is your cover letter. And we'll talk about what that templated cover letter should look like. Number two is your CV or your resume, depending on what type of practice you're looking at. And then number three is a letter of recommendation if it's indicated or requested by the group. So you now, as a fellow planning to start this job search, should have all three of these things ready to go. You don't wanna wait until you have great contact and now you're stuck scrambling, writing the cover letter and building your CV. So as you're starting to engage with uh, different employers, have your sales packet ready. So the second that that person says, hey, send me all your stuff, this is ready to go. So what does the cover letter look like? And I think this is the hardest part for my fellows in the recruitment process. I think the interview stresses them out way less than writing a cover letter. Um, because a cover letter is kind of a weird thing to write. So I'm gonna walk you through what that looks like. It has three paragraphs and it has standard business letter formatting. So for those of you who have not had to write a standard business letter anytime recently, it looks like this. Date, formal address, so doctor so-and-so, medical specialist of California, another space, dear Dr. Tor. Then you start your letter. Paragraph one is your introduction. It should be two to three sentences and it's very templated. Uh, it's really your chance to say, this is why I'm interested in your group. Paragraph two, you wanna sell yourself and really try and stand out. Paragraph two is the hard part. It's just not in our nature to brag about ourselves and our achievements. And so it's a really awkward paragraph to write. Paragraph number three is your brief conclusion. This is your chance to say, this is why I think I'm a good fit for your group. So here's an example of what that cover letter looks like. Paragraph one, again, you're saying, why them? Why do you wanna be a part of this group? So it's really important that you've done your due diligence, you understand that this opportunity is a good fit for you, and this is your chance to tell them why. So I'm a third year internal medicine resident graduating this summer from Miami-Dade. I have family in Los Angeles and I plan on moving there in July and I'm currently looking for opportunities in a hospitalist environment. Okay, really straightforward. One point I wanna highlight here is they said, I have family in Los Angeles. Now, when you're applying for a residency or fellowship or medical school, having family in the region probably isn't the best reason you wanna sell, uh, sell yourself as I'm applying to this program. When I hear, uh, I'm interested in coming to UCLA because my family lives there and it'd just be nice to go home. That's probably not the best reason to join that group. When you're looking for a job though, it's actually a pretty reasonable uh, explanation for why you want to move to an area. And this is why. Family is going to make you happy. Family is going to help you create roots. Okay, it's okay. Assuming you love your family, which I hope everybody does. But uh, family is going to help root you in an area. And that's what these employers want. They want to know that you're going to come to their group, that you're going to be happy there, and that you're going to stay and you're going to thrive. And so, when you're selling why them, you need to include all of the reasons you're interested in going to that group. Now, hopefully it's not just that you have family there and you actually are excited about working in that practice, but family is a very reasonable uh, facet to include. All right, paragraph number two, here comes the weird part. I have consistently been a top performer throughout my medical training. I graduated at the top of my class in medical school. I'm one of my top residents. And I'm always scoring very highly on my in-service exams. I was resident of the year. I have high patient satisfaction. I'm extremely capable, with a, you know, provide good quality of care. And in my current program, I'm considered conscientious, knowledgeable, and a team player. Okay, I'm interested. I think they did a really nice job selling themselves uh, with concrete data points. They perform well on testing. They have high, you know, satisfaction rates from their patients and their colleagues would speak highly of them. So really nice to include in that cover letter. And then number three, you want to recap. So why are you the right choice for the group? If you're interested in an intelligent, well-trained internist who will work hard and maintain a high level of quality that your hospital is known for, please let me know. I'd love the job, okay? Maybe a little braggadocious there, but you get the point, which is you want to sell why you think you're a good fit for them. Why should they hire you? That's what paragraph three does. All really succinct. So part number two is the CV or the resume. And I get a lot of questions of, well, should I send in a CV or should I send in a resume? This slide is gonna help us answer that question. So a resume is really more for a private practice type setting. 
It's emphasizing skills. Uh, you want to use it when you're applying industry nonprofit, uh, but not necessarily academic. It needs to be concise, so two pages max, with maybe an additional page for your publications. If you have been in practice for a while, you really want to lead with your work experience and then put your education at the end because they're most interested in your, your work experience as your portfolio. So resume, more specific for a private practice job. CV is academic medicine. So this is really emphasizing your academic accomplishments when you're applying for university positions. The length is gonna depend on your experience, but it's got all your publications, posters, presentations, teaching that you've been doing. So it's gonna be a much longer document. And you always wanna begin with your education and even will include some of your advisors or some of your bigger projects that you've done because this can be important in academia. So the CV in terms of formatting, it needs to be chronologic. It needs to have consistent structure. So in business school, we spent an entire year working on our CVs and resumes. And structure is key because really you want the reader to be able to understand the flow and the formatting so they can find the data that they want. It should be clean and simple. You want to use verb bullet points. So that means your bullet points describing what you were doing should start with a verb. And absolutely no errors. Absolutely no errors. Let me say that again. When I am looking at fellowship CVs and I'm looking to recruit fellows to our program, if you have typos, poor punctuation, grammatical errors, that is telling me that this single document that is supposed to represent the culmination of all of your work, if you can't spend the time to appropriately put this document together, just imagine what your patient notes are going to look like on a busy clinical practice day. Okay, so no errors, no errors, no errors. Key components that you need to include are objectives. This is that quick one-liner about the job you're looking for. Lead with your education. So this should go all the way back to your undergraduate education. Um, your clinical experience, if you've worked moonlighting or have any really uh, interesting clinical experiences in your uh, fellowship. Um, you wanna talk about your leadership experience, your publications, your lectures. Um, talk about conferences and meetings that you've attended, especially earlier in your career. This creates a nice pattern of involvement at a national level. Um, and talk about your professional associations, especially if you're serving on committees, say within AMSSM, it's a really great thing to include. Um, you want to have some of your administrative stuff. So your license, your DEA, your certifications, that's important to an employer because it helps them know what they're going to need to maintain and update for you. Um, and then the interest section. I want to spend a minute on the interest section. It's my this is my favorite part of looking at a CV because it really tells me about who you are. And, and I would encourage you to have a personal interests and a professional interests subsections. But this is also the part of the CV where so many people go awry. Um, and, and I could give you countless examples of CVs I've reviewed for both jobs and fellows where people just go way off the rails, okay? Um, so so my, I wanna encourage you to include all the things that you love doing but don't get too crazy detailed and have some colleagues do the sniff test just to make sure that you're not putting anything bizarre on there that's really gonna turn folks off. So, um, you know, include all the fun things you like doing, but this is a section of the CV that can only hurt you, okay? Uh, and then lastly is references. And when you're including references, you really want these to be key people throughout your training. So someone that knows you well and has really mentored you, people who have worked with you clinically and can vouch for your clinical experience. And then if you're applying for more academic positions, people who can also attest to your teaching and research uh, experience. So here's an example of a, a resume or a CV. This is one of mine from when I first finished fellowship. Um, you wanna have really clean, consistent formatting. You can see things are indented, they're bolded, uh, justified across the column. So it's really easy on the eyes. Um, so again, if it's ugly, if you just, put it at arm's length and stare at it, and it's just a mess and too busy and overwhelming, people are gonna hold that against you for no good reason. So spend a little bit of time on that formatting, make sure it's really clean, really concise, flows easily on the eyes because that's gonna speak volumes for you. This is such an easy area to have a win in your job search, so it's really worth investing time in. Okay, let's assume all of that has gone splendidly and now you have been invited for an interview. I wanna talk a little bit about what that interview process 
should look like for you. So step one, well before you arrive for interview day, you need to do your research. You are all excellent clinicians. You've spent years and years studying medicine. Spend a little time studying your employer, okay? So prepare before interview day. This involves looking at clinic and health system websites, really understanding who works there, what they do there, what their mission is, where they're growing. I encourage you to look at Yelp reviews. This is actually very helpful, not in terms of you learning about the group, but you learning about the public's perception of the group. If it is nothing but hate mail smeared all over that Yelp review, that's probably not a good sign in terms of what life is like to be practicing there. And then lastly, look up your physician profiles. Remember LinkedIn doximity that I was talking about before. You really need to know your partners inside and out. This is gonna give you a really good sense of what that practice looks like and the people you're gonna be spending time with. Step number two is to, to start to understand the expectations of the position, okay? You wanna know what is that clinic and call schedule gonna look like? What is your team coverage and community involvement gonna be? Are you gonna be spending a lot of time engaged in the community, trying to expand the practice and, and increase patient volume there? Um, is there support for continuing medical education, both in terms of time away from clinic, as well as funding to attend these meetings? Um, what does that salary look like? So salary obviously is not everything when it comes to a job, but again, you want to make sure you are appropriately compensated for the work that you're doing, that you can afford to live in the community that you're going to be practicing. And so when it comes to salary, you want to understand what does that look like? What is your base pay? What does that incentive structure look like? And these private groups, are there partnership opportunities for you? And then also very important are those benefits. Benefits make up a huge component of the cost for an employer. And if you have really spectacular benefits, that's gonna save you a lot of money on the back end. Say for example, all of your health insurance for your entire family is free of charge. That's a big deal. Say there's a really nice pension program at the end. That's a big deal. So really understanding your full benefits package is key. And lastly, a tip as you're starting to move into this interview process is you just wanna clarify who's gonna cover the costs of your interview travel and interview process. Okay, so now let's talk about interview practice. You wanna research common interview questions and we're gonna go over those in a minute. You wanna develop thoughtful answers. And so as you're starting to think through your answers to these really common questions you're gonna be asked, why do you wanna work here? What's your ideal practice like? Where do you see yourself in five years? I encourage you to jot down bullet points. When I see the people have memorized answers, let me tell you, it is very awkward on the interviewee side or interviewer side. So I encourage my fellows to think and just in terms of a couple key bullet points, they wanna make sure that they're getting across to the interviewer during that time. You wanna highlight your personal strengths and interests, okay? This is never more important than in your job search. If you do not make it clear that you love musculoskeletal ultrasound and musculoskeletal procedures, and that that's a big part of the practice for you, and this practice doesn't have a ultrasound machine, that's going to be an inherent disconnect, right? So if there are certain procedures you want to do in your practice, populations you want to take care of, teams you want to be able to cover, research that you want to do, you need to let them know, and it, they may not hire you because of that, but you don't want to take a job that's not a good fit for you, right? You're looking for a real long-term strategy here. So you want to make sure you're highlighting your strengths and highlighting your interests so that you can find that job that's the right fit. You want to know why you want that particular position, okay? I'm excited about the mentorship I'll receive, the patients I can work with, the teams I'll have the opportunity to work with, et cetera. And lastly, don't let the interview be the first time that you are saying your answers out loud. Okay, more awkward stuff in the interview process. Find a friend, find a partner, find a colleague, a co-fellow that you can practice this interview process with and say your answers out loud because the first time you do it, you're probably gonna say something weird and that's okay. Just don't let that something weird happen on game day when you're doing your actual interview. So please take the time to practice with your friends and colleagues as strange as that might feel. It's gonna be a huge difference maker for you on interview day. Okay, fast forward to interview day. What does this look like? First and foremost, you need to know where you are going. We are still very much living in a Zoom-based world, so where you are going might just be the Zoom link to your virtual interview. But for those of us who are back to doing in-person interviews, we're unfortunately not yet at UCLA, but hopefully will be soon, 
You want to confirm that interview time. You want to confirm that interview location. You want to understand where you need to park if this is a big health system or a, a university setting, because uh, that can all trip you up on, uh, on game day. Second, you want to review those bullet point answers. You did a really good job of kind of walking through those in your head, practicing with your colleagues. Now, morning of the interview, you want to run through those one more time. You want to review all that due diligence you've done with regard to the clinic, the health system, the physicians that are part of that group so that you have that front of mind for the day of. And then you want to dress the part. There is no faster way to lose a job than to show up in unprofessional attire. Okay, these are really simple, easy wins for you. So show up in what I call your battle uniform, which is your suit, your shirt, your tie, if that's uh, appropriate for the gentleman, um, but really want to dress the part for that position. And lastly, be on time. If you are late for your interview, just like if you have errors on your CV, I'm going to assume that you will be late for every day of clinic for the entirety of your time with us. All right, so now let's talk about the virtual interview, the ho a whole new beast in the job hunt that many of us are, are working through. Your prep for the, inter inter uh, the virtual interview needs to include testing your technology. Um, we have all become Zoom professionals, but you might got to make sure the internet is working, got to make sure the camera turns on, got to make sure your Zoom is up and running. Number two, you got to set the scene. I have seen some very bizarre backdrops uh, during virtual fellowship interviews. Your goal is to minimize distractions, optimize lighting. You just want them to be able to see your face and not be distracted by kids, partners, animals running around on the back, zebra print wallpaper, whatever it may be. So clean, simple backdrop is a great way to go. You want to monitor your body language. So this is hard in a virtual interview because Naturally, when we talk to people, we make eye contact. Well, when we're talking to a computer, we make eye contact, but sometimes the camera is not where the eyes are, and so it'll look weird, right? So really trying to get that camera centered over where you're going to be seeing that person to try and create as natural uh, a feel as it can be. Uh, next, you want to dress the part. Again, this needs to be the same as an in-person interview. I know it is weird to wear a suit and a tie sitting in your living room, but you got to practice the part uh, just like you would in person. Next, come prepared. Have hard copies of those questions you want to ask on hand. Let me tell you something about that's really nice about virtual interviews is that I got a computer screen in front of me. So I can have my camera on with the video of the patient or person I'm talking to, and I can have a bunch of notes jotted down right next to it. So it's a really natural, easy way to have those notes available for yourself. And then lastly, you want to try and make a personal connection. When humans interact in person, we naturally make these human connections. We shake hands. We have a little bit of small talk before the interview starts as we're moving from room to room or meeting to meeting. And a lot of that is lost in this virtual setting where we all just kind of pop into the room. And so I encourage you to take just a little bit of time to make a little bit of that small talk. Do your best to make a personal connection because we're losing so much of that in this virtual-based setting. Okay, so let's talk about some questions you could ask. Every interviewer at the end is gonna say, well, what questions can I answer for you? And here are some that you should think about. Uh, what does a typical day or a week look like in this role? Okay, you wanna understand what that weekly workflow is gonna look like. Are you moving around to different clinics every day? Or do you have administrative time? Are you gonna be spending time in a training room or on a sideline? What are the expectations of the position? So this includes call, clinic schedules, team and event coverage, urgent care coverage. This is a really um, big component of a lot of primary care sports medicine physicians these days. There are more and more orthopedic urgent cares popping up. And a lot of times they will use these urgent care settings to try and create more business for the group. So are you gonna be expected to be seeing these urgent care type patients? What are the practice's goals, both short and long-term? So you want to understand where this system is trying to grow and, and, and then subsequently understand how you fit into it. Tied on to that, what are your performance expectations for this position? So are there is an RVU uh, expectation, number of patients to see every day? Are you supposed to be doing a lot of community outreach and generating more business for the group? Are you supposed to be teaching, et cetera? You want to ask them how they would describe the ideal candidate for the position. 
you would hope that would be you. But if they're describing somebody with a totally different skill set and totally different set of interests than what you have, it's just probably not going to be a good fit. And you want to figure that out now before you move your whole family across the country. You want to ask them, how would you describe the culture of the practice? And this is huge. And I encourage residents looking at fellowship to think about this. And I would even more so encourage fellows looking at clinical practices to think about this. Describe your relationship with your partners and your surgical colleagues. I hope the answer is collegial. And they're probably going to give you some, you know, rose colored glasses version of whatever the truth is. But you really want to understand what that collaboration looks like because that's going to be your new daily life. Another question to think about is where do you sit in the organizational hierarchy? So who are you reporting to? Um, who are those administrators that are supervising you and controlling what your practice looks like? Do we anticipate this changing? So sometimes, you know, a group will move from the Department of Family Medicine to the Department of Orthopedic Surgery or PM&R. Um, and so you really want to know if this is going to change. And then what are your opportunities for growth within the institution? Are you going to have advances in pay and advances in, you know, coverage opportunities, et cetera? And then lastly, is a really important question, just so you understand where to go from there, is can you walk me through the next steps in this hiring process? Um, so many fellows and, and applicants will leave the interview day and then just kind of wait and don't really know where things are going to go from there. And at the end of the interview is a great opportunity to just say, how are things going to go from here? So when it comes to that follow-up, that wrap-up, you want to talk about those next steps and appropriate follow-up. So what's next in this process? What should I anticipate going forward? So that they may say, all right, well, we're interviewing five more candidates over the next month, and we're going to let you know at the end of the month. Great. You have a really clear understanding of that path forward. Number two, you want to get a thank you letter out within 24 hours. And I made a little note here for myself, email versus handwritten note. Um, I consider myself an old-fashioned Midwestern guy. I really do appreciate a handwritten note, but I also work in an academic system, and I have comically gotten handwritten notes delivered to my office six months after interview season as my next round of fellows are already showing up on campus. And so I, I think the answer is email. It is timely. Uh, you know it's going to be delivered appropriately, and it's sort of the way that things are now. I'll never forget, I interviewed for a job at NYU, met a great group of faculty, and before I had gotten to the airport, I had thank you letters from every faculty member I had interviewed at NYU, and I was so impressed. You should be doing the same thing. You want to send an email, if you're traveling for the interview, send it on the way to the airport. Make sure that it's getting there immediately while you're top of mind for them, okay? Sending it multiple weeks later tells me you're probably not that organized and it took you that long just to send a simple email. So within 24 hours, that's going to make a huge difference. In that email, support your candidacy, okay? You want to say, I listened to you throughout this day. I understand the needs of this group. I understand the challenges of this group. And here's how I think I'm the right person to help you address those challenges. It can be as simple as, thank you for interviewing me. It was great to hear about how you're trying to grow your diagnostic ultrasound program within the sports medicine division. Uh, I think I've had exceptional training on diagnostic ultrasound in addition to all the other great, awesome things I've learned to do. And I think I'd be a great asset to your group. Nice and simple. Proofread, proofread, proofread. Same comments I made about your same your CV. That goes for your cover letter. That goes for your follow-up email. I will never forget when I was applying for fellowship, I sent, uh, I received an email from Dr. John D. Fiore, UCLA fellowship director at the time. I knew this urgency in replying. I happened to be traveling in Central America on some dial-up Wi-Fi in the middle of Panama. Typed up an email and this Spanish language browser autocorrected D Fiori with an I to D Fiori with an E. And I had sent before I proofread it, and I have never lived it down to this day. Proofread, proofread, proofread. Also, don't use Panamanian internet if you can avoid it. All right. And with that, I want to turn it over to questions from the group. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I, I really hope this was helpful in that uh, job hunt process. And I just want to encourage you to really invest the time and energy you need to in this process. You have spent years of your life training to get it to this point in your career. 
make sure you're spending the time and investing the energy in finding that really perfect dream job for you because you deserve it. And it's just about making sure you do your due diligence in the process. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Shane and give a shout out to uh, one of my favorite movies in the world, Step Brothers. All right, Shane, take it away. I figured we could just do 15 minutes of Step Brothers quotes back and forth. Uh, that's I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> All right, but I'm the Will Ferrell character. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us. I've got a few questions coming up and I, I'd really encourage all of you to really come back to this talk. I mean, it's gonna be posted on the MSSM YouTube page. Um, there's so much content in here that you may not have even thought about um, as you know your fall sports season is coming to an end and you start really looking for a job. That's why we thought this would be a great time for that. But it's not just excellent for current fellows. I mean, if you're thinking about changing jobs or even applying to fellowships, a lot of the stuff that, that Dr. Goldman talked about really applies. And what you've looked at for residencies and fellowships applies to your job too. Fit is important, not just, you know, you want to sell yourself, like you said, but you also want to make sure that you're going to like the job. You got to fit in well too, so... With those little comments, uh, again, I got a few questions for, for you, Josh. Um, what if you don't find that dream job in your search and, and you're up against kind of, you know, you're getting into April, AMSSM's coming around, you're checking the job postings on the, the bulletin board there, and, and you're just not finding something. Do you have a recommendation on <laughs> what to quote unquote settle for? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's the reality, honestly, Shane, right? I mean, for most of us, the dream job is not your first job, right? The dream job is going to, it's going to be a path to that job. So I think the, the ideal scenario is really finding a job that is a meaningful dot on that journey, so to speak. So say your goal is to be in academic medicine. You want to, you know, I, I hear all the time, I want to be a fellowship director. I want to cover football. I want to do what you do. That's what I told my fellowship director when I was sitting in his office. Um, and so the first step is to get into an academic medical center and start to do good work, learn to take care of patients, uh, be a meaningful member of the team, and then more positions are going to come to you. Same thing goes for a private practice, right? If your goal is to be in a very specific private practice, but that group's not hiring, get into another private practice with a similar mission, build your book of business, get busy, become an efficient practitioner, you know, grow your reputation in the community, take good care of patients so they know and love you. And then that private practice group that you really wanted to work for, they're going to come knocking on your door saying, all right, how much do we have to pay you to get to come down the street and bring all your patients with you, right? So I think the first job just needs to be a meaningful step in the direction you want to go, right? If, if you want to work in academics, you know, taking a private practice job with 50% urgent care, like you're just not going to be happy there, you know? Um, so, so get as close as you can get, you know, check as many of those boxes as possible, but know that nobody really gets their dream job first time out of fellowship. Um, and Shane, maybe you can share some of your fellow experiences, but I, I've had tons of fellows that, you know, there was the dream job and then the job that they took had a lot of those components, but not all of them. Within a year, somebody in that group leaves. All of a sudden, now they've got D1 coverage. All of a sudden, now they're core faculty in the fellowship program. You just never know what's going to happen in these larger groups and who's going to leave and when. And so if you can get yourself into a system you're excited about, those opportunities are going to open up. I don't know if you've seen that with your fellows, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, our fellowship, similar to yours, I mean, we get a lot of graduates each year. We have three fellows right now. And there's just a large variety of things that they do. But, and you will probably have some friends or people that you know of that fell into that dream job, but that's, that's not common. It's like, well, yeah, now I'm the team doc for a D1 school. I just graduated fellowship. I mean, most people work years to get to that point and, you know, get really involved with, you know, high school coverage and then, you know, D3 college coverage or something like that and really build their resume and I just come back to really what you said on, on your stage one here is make a list of those uh, 10 to 12 things that you listed on what's important to you and kind of check down. And you may not find something that fits all 12 of those things, but you'll find a job that encompasses most of those. And like you said, as long as your non-compete's not too uh, restrictive, you know, you build, a, build your practice 
you build a reputation, uh, hopefully a good one, and then they're knocking down your door and then you do end up getting your dream job down the road. So Josh, can you talk a little bit about, um, obviously you're, you know, went from USC to UCLA and you're, you're still there. How did, can you share your experience and how you came to the job there? Yeah. So, you know, it's getting that I, I was shooting for one of those growth positions. So this was an opportunity where, you know, the, the division of sports medicine was looking to expand. They've been doing all this groundwork building for a year or so trying to create a new position for me. And, uh, you know, my fellowship director and division chief at the time said, you know, we, there's this position, it's in the pipe. I think you'd be a good fit for you, but I don't know when it's going to be available. Um, so I ended up taking a, a different job at UCLA, working in our community facing side, not on the academic medicine. So UCLA has um, a community facing group called the faculty practice group that spends the majority of its time in clinical care. I took a great position doing sports medicine, clinical practice at UCLA on the faculty practice group side while the academic division was still trying to develop this position. We didn't know how long it was going to take. And so I just took a good job in the area. Uh, within six months of taking that job, one of our faculty members left for the University of Maine. <laughs> and so division chief calls me and says, hey, I don't know how much you like that job there to how long your contract is, but I got a spot for you all of a sudden if you want to take this job. So I finished out the term of my contract, transitioned over to that role. So it happened pretty quickly for me, but it was an unexpected departure that really helped with that transition. The job that I ended up, or that I was, quote, waiting for, took two more years to come to fruition. We ended up hiring one of our fellows two years later. So it, it really is an, a testament to how some of these developmental positions can really take a long time to, to come to fruition. And so you know, to Shane's point, have your dream job and then have like a pretty close second to it and, and be okay with that. And just know that things are always changing in, in bigger groups and people are always leaving. And so things can evolve there. And then, I, so I ended up in the academic medicine side, our division chief, who was fellowship director and took care of UCLA football, ended up taking another job at Hospital for Special Surgery, where he's the division chief now. And then I ended up becoming fellowship director and, and UCLA football team physician pretty quickly thereafter. So it was a series of fortunate events. I was in the right place at the right time. But going back to that fundamental of get into a great system, work hard, always be available for volunteer opportunities. You know, if you, if you want to do coverage and every time a group calls you to ask you to help with coverage, you're busy doing something, probably going to stop calling you to ask for help for coverage, right? So being available. And then when you're there, work hard, make sure people like you, take good care of patients, do the right thing. You'll be all right. Yeah. Be available is a really big one. So, all right. A few other questions for you. How do you, how do you approach the question? What is your anticipated salary? Do you have any good resources for that and how to negotiate oh shane you queued us up for our upcoming talk so hey the the best data point in terms of what is your anticipated salary is knowing what appropriate salaries in the region in that setting at that time are and so we've got a really great upcoming talk i forgot to plug all of our upcoming talks at the end i had i had one more slide for us it said our position contracts and negotiations coming soon recent graduate salary information coming soon. So that's gonna be a huge part of your negotiation is understanding what people are being paid. In general, academics are gonna try and lowball you. Private practice is gonna pay you $1 more than they need to, to, get, to keep you from quitting because nobody's incentivized to pay you more money other than they just want you to stay and keep working hard. So um, just knowing what is fair and what is appropriate for that practice setting and your rank and station is key. If you show up and you say, I wanna make a million dollars a year and that's my first year out of fellowship, I'm gonna say, good luck. <laughs> but if you know what, you know, in the region, well, fellows for the past three years working in a similar practice setting are making $220,000 a year, $250,000 a year. I think that's very reasonable. So you wanna make sure you're getting paid enough for the work you're gonna be doing. And that's where you really got to utilize your, your alumni, your resources. Like you said, Matt Leisler is going to talk about the, the, the practice survey uh, in January. But a lot of that data is also on the MSSM website going back over 10 years. If you just want to look at that, and basically asking recent graduates and also just graduates that are 
one to five years out, six to 10 years out, what are you making, you know, um, and uh, what are you doing? You need family medicine, sports medicine, there's a lot of great tips in there. So stay tuned for that. Um, I had a second year that asked what we think the job market will look like in five to 10 years. There's a big question. So my, my prediction is good. Um, you know, we've always been a little worried about oversaturation of the market in primary care sports medicine because there are so many new fellowships uh, coming to fruition. And so now we've just got a much larger volume of fellows entering the job market every year. But I, I think in parallel, AMSSM and other national organizations have done a really good job of educating health systems and the public about what a primary care sports medicine physician is and the huge benefit we have to health systems and to patient care. And so I've seen you know, pretty consistent growth year over year in most of the larger health systems when it comes to expanding the footprint of primary care sports medicine. I know at UCLA, we've doubled our primary care sports medicine physician number in the past five years. Um, and I've seen something similar in sort of bigger academic centers, pushing out to more satellites, um, you know, John DeFiore was telling me hospital for special surgery is almost up to 20 primary care sports medicine physicians in their group. They were half of that uh, a decade ago. So there's really nice growth in our field. Uh, the question is just going to be, does it parallel the growth in number of fellowships? If the fellowships exceed the growth in the market, the market may start to cool. But for now, I think we're in a really good space. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. And I, I think it depends on what you're looking for. Again, if you come back to well, I just want to be a D1 team position. Yeah, I mean, you, that's a little saturated, you know. But as far as, just to your point, I mean, we have one ortho group in town that's looking for somebody. Um, there's another ortho group that's a couple hours away that's looking for three providers. Um, we've got an academic, you know, uh, fellowship around here that's looking to hire somebody. So so I, 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 I agree with you. I think it's very positive. So... And let's see, any tips to land a job covering professional teams like NBA basketball? Do they like sports med docs with a more clinical focus or <clears throat> academic sports med docs with more research experience? Um, what's your experience out there with, with the Dodgers and Lakers and stuff? Um, okay, so a couple different components to this. Number one, a large number of professional team coverage opportunities are being purchased by big health systems. So as much as I would love to say that we are the Dodgers and Lakers team doctors because we are the best in the West, uh, we're the Dodgers and the Lakers team doctors because they created a really nice, mutually beneficial partnership with UCLA. Uh, and we provide really comprehensive health care for the entirety of those systems. And, and it's been a really great, mutually beneficial partnership. So the step number one is working for a health system that is interested in covering professional teams. Um, Number two, most of the professional leagues now have an experience requirement. You have to be a certain number of years postgraduate. You have to have had a certain number of years of, quote, high-level coverage. Typically, that's collegiate or, or sort of minor league, semi-professional coverage um, as a mandate to be considered for a team physicians for those jobs. So really what most professional teams are looking for is large health systems to partnership with or to create partnerships with and to team physicians with experience covering high level teams, ideally in that sport. So if you want to be an NBA team physician, it'd be nice to start at a collegiate level basketball, work your way up to the G League, and then ultimately up to the NBA is sort of the, the pipeline I see, all assuming that you're in a city with an NBA team and they're affiliated with a health system that you can work for. And some of that, some of it comes down to luck, I guess, just speaking from our experience, you know, we've had the U.S. figure skating championships come here three times um, just because of the facilities that they have uh, in Greensboro, surprisingly amazing, <laughs> you know, for the small area that it is. And just within that, um, a couple of our docs have been asked to be, you know, figure skating team physicians, you know, if they if they need them. So so some of that comes into play, too, uh, if you're looking for for that. So and um, can you speak to how comfortable you felt after you graduated fellowship, especially not just taking care of patients, but doing procedures with ultrasound, with, you know, just injections, uh, yeah. if you want to go beyond that, and 10x PRP, things like that, too. 
Um, so Shane, tell me if this was your experience too. I think the first year of out of fellowship is the most terrifying year of your medical career because for the first time you're flying solo. Um, and it's you've you've just always lived in a clinical practice environment where you've had direct or indirect support. Um, so I think it's just inherently terrifying. I encourage you to work on your poker face. It really terrifies patients when they see the terror in your eyes. Um, but I, I think it's natural to be a little apprehensive in that first year of practice. I think things that make that easier are good mentorship in your training program, having colleagues, you know, ideally in the clinical practice you're joining that you can come to with challenging cases or scenarios, or if you need to support for a procedure for the first couple that you do, I think that's okay. Um, and I think having opportunities to practice autonomously in your fellowship can actually pacify some of that experience. You know, I know as a resident, I did a lot of moonlighting and urgent cares. And that created a lot of confidence for me because it was just that autonomous practice setting. So I think there are a few ways to mitigate that anxiety, but I think it's pretty natural to be apprehensive and, and question yourself at most turns in your first year of practice. It just reminds me of, I think there's like the first season of Scrubs, JD asked Turk, he's like, how are you like totally cool with this? He's like, well, I wear a mask and under the mask, I just look like this all day. You know, like <laughs> it, it's it's terrifying. It's, it's so absolutely true. terrifying. But but like you said, I mean, it, it's rely on. I, I still have fellows that uh, gra that graduated that send me, you know, X rays or you know, will you look at this? Let me know. Um, even though they know what they're doing, you know, still having someone to bounce something off of, you know, the orthopedist, you know, doing stuff in your residency and fellowship, take every opportunity you can to ask us questions. I mean, that's what we're here for. Um, and use us even after you graduate. You don't just magically go away. Um, we're still here for you. So, And Andy just uh, linked the um, recent graduate practice and salary surveys in the chat for those of you that were asking about that. Um, I think I got one more question for you, Josh. Um, trying to kind of read poker faces and everything. Uh, any tips kind of reading between the lines, you know, when you're in the culture between, you know, different departments, so sports medicine versus ortho, how do you kind of read an orthopod? Um, yeah. Do they have feeling? No, I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> um, so I think the best tip here is talk to the junior faculty. The junior faculty aren't getting paid the big bucks to sweet talk you and convince you to join that group. If they pull you over to the corner and tell you to run for the hills, it's probably a bad sign, right? Because the June, the people that are new to the group, new to the culture, especially if they didn't train there, I think it's sort of different if you've trained within a program, but someone who comes from the outside with a fresh set of eyes and hasn't been there very long and isn't that, you know, uh, bought into the Kool-Aid, so to speak, is going to give you a really fair assessment of what that program looks like. I think you can talk to the staff too, you know, uh, your MAs, your RNs, your administrative assistants, they will give it to you straight. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, the CEO, the division chief, the department chair, they're, they're going to be in, incredibly positive and optimistic. I mean, it's their department. So if they say it's bad, it's their own fault. Uh, but really the, the people who are in the trenches are going to give it to you straight. And I, I think we'll be pretty honest. And again, as we're hiring people, the last thing I want is to hire somebody who comes there and is miserable, right? You're just going to leave like that. That's terrible for everybody. So, um, I, I think it's, people will be honest with you because they want you to be happy there. And I think you even see that in fellowships. I mean, what we hear is you get the most and the best feedback from the fellows, right? So you get the best feedback from, like you said, the junior faculty, from the people that have just been hired from the staff, you know, pick their brains. Do they look happy? Um, are you being hustled through the clinical hallway? Cause they don't want you looking at anybody frowning and stuff. So yeah, yeah, pick up on that stuff. So, well, again, I just wanna uh, thank Dr. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Josh, for, for doing this. Like I said, it's an awesome talk, please. You know, look at this on the AMSSM website, on the YouTube uh, channel that they have. And again, please join us next month. Uh, we've got a great, great talk on contract negotiations um, and many more to come, hopefully. So hopefully you found this beneficial. 
Uh, thank Josh. Uh, thank Elliot for, for, for being our, our leader. So uh, thanks again, Josh. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Elliot, and the rest of the committee. Really excited about the rest of the talks we have in the pipe. All right. Have a good, well, I guess, good evening. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you staying up late on the East Coast. Take care, Josh.